I hope everyone is doing well. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I'm glad that the election is over. I hope nobody lost any family or friends from any political differences. Um, I know that people get very heated about these things. Um, I used to also, but uh, I realized the madness of being polarized, especially by the media. So I hope that uh, no one else has really fallen into that trap. I'm also glad that I'm gonna stop seeing all these political ads on YouTube. And uh, I'm actually gonna be glad to know how Wikibuy can save me money on Best Buy and Amazon. So a uh, little back to normal, not completely. Um, hopefully today's message will provide a broader perspective on, uh, on the matters at hand, the issues in this world. We're gonna talk about Hebrews chapter 11 and Hebrews chapter 11 is uh, basically the entire chapter talks about faith. And I know it's a very broad topic. I don't have a theology degree again. I'm not the most qualified person to talk about faith. I'm a very imperfect vessel. Um, but what I can do is share my own perspective and my own struggles and my own challenges and how I deal with faith. All right. So uh, what you see here is um, it's a cross that we have hanging in. Our, it's, it's sitting on a shelf in our bathroom. And uh, you see what it says over here? This is a, it's actually Hebrews 11. 1. All right. That's the first I verse. You shared your screen. Nobody can see. Oh, it's not. Mm, you can't. How about now? Now? Can you see it now? Okay. Sorry about that. All right. Anyway, the this is the first slide. Um, but anyway, so I was saying this is a little statue thing that we have on a sitting on a shelf in our bathroom. And uh, what it says here is Hebrews 11.1. 1. It's the first verse of the book of Hebrews. And it says, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And like, basically, I see this every time I use the bathroom. And uh, it's sometimes like, you know, your, your mind just wanders. And uh, I was thinking like, well, it's kind of like my kidney, right? Because I never really saw my my kidney before. And I hope that it's working, at least for now. But, and I have faith that it works and I, and I believe that it's there. But then like my mind wandered off even more. I don't know if other people's minds wander like this, but mine often does. What if I don't have a kidney? What if I only have one kidney? There are people that are born without certain organs and they don't realize their whole life. Like some people are born without spleens or gallbladders. But uh, anyway, that my mind was just wandering. And uh, there's a bunch of things going on in our body that we've never seen or we are even aware of, but we assume that they work and we kind of take it for granted. We take it by faith that they're always gonna work. So do I have faith in my organs? Yeah, you can say that. Do I have faith that the next time I go to McDonald's and I eat a hamburger, I won't drop dead? Yeah, I think so. Do I have faith that if I turn around and look behind me right now, there's not gonna be a scary clown? behind me okay now i'm sure but it's funny every time i i do check like once once in a while behind me maybe i'm just paranoid but like when you're alone in a room you're always not completely certain but i mean it's just like out of fear right out of paranoia do i have faith that my parents will bail me out of jail if i do something well i guess it depends on what it is but i think in most cases they will some wouldn't call these things faith. It's more fact, right? We know that because the anatomy book says that people have kidneys and that they've done scans on other people's bodies. And obviously everyone else, most other people have kidneys. Then you know that most likely I have a kidney. So I don't really need to have faith for that. People aren't dropping dead left and right from eating chicken nuggets. And there has never been a scary clown waiting lurking behind me 
while I'm sitting down, so I don't have to worry about that. And my parents have helped me countless times in the past, so I don't need to worry about the fact that they're going to help me in a time of need. We have ample evidence that we can observe. Although it's not 100%, the probability is near 100%. So in a way, us human beings, we're like probability calculators, right? We make endless risk computations constantly. Almost every decision we make involves some kind of probability computation, right? What to wear outside? Okay, what's the weather gonna be like today? What are the chances that it's gonna rain? What's the chance it's gonna be hot or cold? What are the chances that if I wear this shirt today that I'm going to offend somebody or I'm going to not look the way I'm supposed to in somebody's eyes if I go out? We make the same, same calculations when we make purchases, when we buy stuff, right? Should I buy it now? What if there's a sale next week? Will I need this thing? What are the, what's the chances that I actually need this thing? Or even like how quickly we should respond to somebody's text message, something as simple as that. Like some people, I can wait till tomorrow to respond. Some people I need to respond right away. Otherwise they're gonna get upset. So we, we know like we calculate all these risks in our mind, right? We know that in this case, in, that, this, in this other case, we can, what we can do or not. Or even like how quickly, if you're, uh, if you're still living with your parents, how quickly you should respond to your parents, right? Some, of, some kids will push their luck as far as possible. Maybe I'll wait to the seventh time my mom calls me before I respond, before she gets really upset. Or uh, if I want something from my parents, then maybe I'll respond right away just to make them happy. Or when to wake up, when to sleep. And then later on, when you grow up, maybe you'll hit some falls and like get into gambling and uh, or you take risks like skydiving or mountain climbing or even just uh, investing in the stock market right these are all these are all involved calculated risks and we learn to trust ourselves with these things right we learn over over time that we think we're pretty good at calculating risk and understanding the probabilities of what's going to happen and we take comfort in this after a while and some of us think that we're better than most people at calculating risk. All right, I, uh, I hope God forgives me for using a South Park episode for today. I know they can be very irreverent and uh, you know they can be pretty uh, inappropriate sometimes, but this episode has always stuck with me because I think it's so poignant how it highlights a person's bad decision-making skills. So in this episode, it's called the underpants gnomes episode. So what's happening is you have these gnomes and they wanna make money, right? And their business their uh, business strategy is to start collecting underpants, stealing it, whatever. But they have in the middle phase two, which is the question mark, like we're gonna collect underpants and then we're gonna profit, but we don't know what that question mark thing is, but we don't need to know. We're just gonna go forward with it and uh, hopefully we'll succeed. And uh, I think this represents a lot of the decisions that we make in our life. Even though we think that, you know, some things are fairly certain, we all think most decisions that we make are pretty good decisions. And uh, in most, many cases, we appear to succeed, or it turns out the way that we plan. But we know that success looks very, very different in God's eyes. So we need to ex re-examine this formula, phase one, phase two, phase three. So phase two is what, uh, it's the title of today's message and what I call the X factor. Okay, so what is the X factor? The X factor is, this is there's actually a definition for X factor. It's not the TV show and it's not the X-Men. There's a term called the X factor and the definition is a variable in a given situation that could have the most significant impact on the outcome. Okay, I'll read that again. I don't have it on the on the slide, but it's a variable in a given situation that could have the most significant impact on the outcome. That's the X factor. Let's keep going. So one day we make a lot of decision in our life. One day we're asked to make another decision. And that decision is to choose eternal life or death. And it comes down for most people to another calculated risk. 
at face value, it's an easy decision, right? Life or death. Of course, we choose life. Unless you're burdened by pride and the fear of being judged by others for accepting Christianity. Other than that, it's an easy choice. After all, infinity, infinite good is better than infinite bad. And we get baptized and think, okay, we're okay now. We don't need to worry about this thing anymore. And because of this calculated decision that we made, okay, we're saved and it's time to move on to the next decision. All right, what are, what are next some upcoming decisions that we have? Should we go to prep school or should we spend time in devotion? Should we study more or should we spend some time in prayer? Should we work overtime if you're an adult or go to church? Or should I save for a nice car or should I tithe more? So these are all decisions that we make. And what choices do some of us or many of us make? We make the pragmatic one, right? Because it has the most near-term results. So we'll choose prep school. We'll choose study. We'll choose working over, working on overtime. And we'll work on saving for that nice thing that we want to buy. These are based on calculations, our reasoning. The former yields better returns than the latter, right? the pragmatic choice versus the choice that God wants us to make. And we go through and uh, we, we make these decisions on all these different things. Over time, the warnings about the love of money become more and more relevant to our lives, right? Because again, all these things, prep school study, all these things, in the end, the goal is to be successful, is to make more money, right? And then the love of money is the root of all evil becomes more realistic in our lives. It's not, it's no longer a cautionary tale, but it actually describes the life that we're living. And before you know it, God is just an idea that you filed into the back of your mind. And you become so used to trusting yourself. You forget that we were saved. We were saved from ourselves and we're saved from the rational creatures that we are. So there's this uh, apologetics devotional that we're using. And there's just this one quote that I really liked from the author, Ron Rhodes. I don't have it on the screen, but I'll read it to you. It's short. He says that we must ever be on guard against the human mind's capability of rationalization. And uh, he wrote that on the topic of abortion. And the reason why he said this is because like, the human mind will figure out all different ways to rationalize the most evil of acts. So we'll think like, oh yeah, um, I can't afford to give this baby a good life anyway, so I might as well just kill the baby. Or, um, you know, I, I, I worked hard my whole life and now I just want to enjoy my life. So I just don't want this baby. So, but that applies to almost to a lot of decisions that we make, right? We'll, use our ability to reason, to ration, rationalize, and we'll make a decision that totally goes against the grain of what God wants us to do. It's the reason that caused Adam and Eve to fall. What choice did they make? Yeah, that makes sense. It'd be good to know about good and evil. It doesn't sound like such a bad thing. We know how that turned out. Abraham had a child with his servant, Hagar, and, uh, when his wife presented him with that choice, I mean, he, he probably thought, okay, sure, since my wife is okay with it, I'm just going to go along with her plan. And we know that this is, a, this is a belief from the Muslims. They believe that Muhammad is a descendant of Ishmael, which is the child that was the result of Abraham and Hagar. And uh, we're feeling that the consequences of that decision even today. We see this mentioned in Hebrews 11 all of these different uh, all of these different scenarios so we'll read in Genesis 17 1 to 2 when Abram was 99 years old the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him I am God Almighty walk before me and be blameless blameless that I may make my covenant between me and you so we're going to go through and read about uh, Hebrews mention a lot of very well-known people in the Old Testament, the heroes of the Old Testament. This one applied to Abraham. 
before he was called Abraham, he was called Abram. Over here in 1 Kings 9.4, we talk about David. And as for you, if you will walk before me as David, your father, walked with integrity of heart and uprightness, doing according to all that I have commanded you and keeping my statutes and my rules. So God is talking to Solomon here, but God is saying that his father, Solomon's father, David, walked with God. In Genesis 6, 9, it says, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. In Genesis 5, 23, 24, it says, Enoch lived 365 years, <clears throat> walking in close fellowship with God. Then one day he disappeared because God took him. So out of these four, obviously Enoch is kind of the one that stands out because Enoch never died. He was so righteous and uh, in God's eyes that God spared him from death and just took him straight to heaven. The rest of the people, it doesn't say much more about Enoch, so we don't know like anything that any bad things that he did, but this, it, it, that's as far as the, uh, the Old Testament mentions him. Now, for the other three people, they're pretty flawed people, as some of you may know. You may be asking, how could they walk, have walked with God if they were sinners, right? Abraham was, he, dis, he uh, didn't really fully trust God's promise, and he had a son, a child with his slave. He lied to rulers in different areas while he was traversing through the territory because he was afraid of them killing them. His family. David, we all know what he did, right? He um, he took an uh, unsanctioned, sir, unsanctioned census. God never commanded. And uh, tens of thousands of his people died. He committed murder and adultery. Noah was caught drunk and naked by his kids. So were they righteous because they believed according to the law? Wait a minute. There was no law during this time for Abraham and Noah. There was no Old Testament. There was no Torah. Abraham, Enoch, Noah. There wasn't an, even an Israel, na Israel nation. So what was their righteousness based on? Was it based on their character, their morality, their ability to make good decisions, their ability to measure risk? In fact, there's no mention of this. In the Bible at all. But this is what we do see. This is a little long, but let's read through this together. This is Romans 4, 13 to 24. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through law, but through the righteousness of faith. For it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs. Faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath. But there, where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all of his offspring. Right? What we want to see here is that the promise may rest on grace. It's not a work by man. Right? Obeying the law is a work by man. Not only to the not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, he believed against hope. Who is he? He is Abraham. That he should become the father of many nations, as he has been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in the faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver continuing concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his face was, was counted to him as righteousness, but the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Romans 3, 23, 24, going back a chapter. The righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace 
through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So what are the key takeaways from these two passages? I think the author, some believe it's Paul, some think maybe somebody else wrote. Oh, no, I'm, this is a. Uh, this is Romans. We were talking about Hebrews. Paul definitely wrote Romans. Sorry, I was confused. The author, Paul is making it clear here that the law does not justify us. We can observe the law all we want, but in the end, observing the law is only a work, right? It doesn't take our heart to observe the law. It doesn't make us righteous. And we all fall short of that law because I'm pretty sure none of us is, are able to faithfully observe God's laws 100% all of the time. We all fall short of it. So how do we become right with God? How did Abraham? Well, it's clear that the answer was through faith. The verse that sticks out the most for me in Romans 4 is what I highlighted in yellow. In hope, he believed against hope. That's kind of a strange thing to say, right? But it sums up faith, I think, so well. Faith is essentially believing in what our senses tell us otherwise. We, in our flesh, in our fleshly hope, we expect one thing, but when God in his wisdom comes through, it's almost always destructive, it's always unexpected, but it's always perfect. Faith is where we end up when we run out of options. All our planning, rationalizing, scheming, it all leaves us at a dead end. And that's where we'd always end up we'd end up dead, we'd end up hopeless. When viewed through human eyes, when we've rationalized this through over and over again, life ends and that's it. We know like without the promise of God, we know that our hope is really, is, really isn't hope at all. It's just, it just ends, it's a dead end. That's where our hope takes us. So Abraham hoped against human hope Hope against his ability to hope as a human being. Hope for something that's beyond what he could understand. Faith is irrational from a human perspective. Isaiah 55, 8 to 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Now, let's look at Moses. Moses is also mentioned in Hebrews 11. There's no verse that explicitly said that Moses walked with God. But I think if you just look at the story of Moses, he literally walked with God through the wilderness for 40 years. And even before that, he led the Israelites through the wilderness. There's a well-known 19th century evangelist called D.L. Moody who wrote this about Moses, which I really liked. I have. I don't think I have it here. He wrote, he spent 40 years in Egypt thinking he was a somebody, right? Moses was, he, he had a very high position in Egypt. He spent 40 years in the wilderness finding out that he was a nobody after he fled Egypt because he killed uh, an Egyptian there. And he spent another 40 years finding out what God could do with a somebody who found out that without God, he is a nobody. Now, one little interesting side note, D.L. Moody, the guy who wrote this quote, is also a proponent of the Kazikian movement because Kazikian sounds a little familiar, right? America's Kazik. So he was one of the main founders of this movement. And uh, I just thought it was kind of a weird little coincidence. So this quote expands on faith. Is faith a work then? Is, it some, is faith something that's done, that can be credited towards us? Should it be something that we should take credit for? I think the answer is a little complicated. Yes and no. It is something that we do, but it's something that's done in humility. Instead of most works that require taking a step forward, doing something in faith or having faith involves taking, taking a step back. Faith says, I can't do this. But faith says, Lord, you can do this. In Deuteronomy 31.8, it says, It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you 
or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. So obviously it says here that the Lord, the Lord goes before us. But in order for him to do that, we have to step back. It's a simple gesture. You just take a step back, right? But it makes all the difference in the world. Because for most people, that's a very difficult thing to do. Because we're so used to stepping forward, making our own judgments and our decisions. And when we don't trust God in our lives, when we don't allow God to go before us, there are consequences. When we don't have the faith, when we don't have the faith to let God lead, we run into all these problems in our lives. Let's take a look at this picture. So um, I use Google Maps, and Google Maps allows you to plot like distances from one point to another. The journey. This is the uh, this is the area where Exodus took place. So it's the the journey of Exodus started in an Egyptian city called Ramses, and it ended in a place called. Kadesh Barnea, that was right on the border of the promised land. Now, it was surprising to me that there's still a place called Kadesh Barnea in Israel, like several thousand years later. Look at the distance from the starting point to the end point. How many miles is that? It says down right here. It's 151 miles from where the Jews, from, from where the Israelites started their journey to where it should have ended. Now, the problem is, this span right over here in the middle, along the northern border, and along the northern uh, region of this, this section over here, was Philistine territory. Now, this is what is written in Exodus 13, 17 about this journey. In Exodus 13, 17, it says, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. So God knew that, sorry, God knew that if he led the people through this path, this 150 miles or so, probably would have taken like maybe a couple weeks, right? Or maybe a few months at most for millions of people to travel that distance. God knew that if he took them across this path, they would have turned back to Egypt for sure because they'd fear, they'd be scared, and they'd want to embrace their old life. Again, they would make that calculated decision that going back to Egypt is probably better for me than suffering war and conflict in the, Phil in the Philistine territories. So instead of this journey taking a few months, it actually took three years. So after three years of journeying through the wilderness, this is the actual path. This is the, the a map of the journey of Exodus. Okay, they started in Ramses. They walked along the bottom, I guess, to avoid the Philistine territories. And uh, after three years, they arrived at Kadesh Barnea, the border it's about two or three years. Now they think it's three years because that's when they celebrated the third Passover. Um, so they arrived. They're right at the outskirts of the promised land. And what do they do? Well, they wanted to see if it was safe to enter the region. So they spent, they sent 12 spies. And when the 12 spies came back, 10 of them warned the Israelites that no, these it's not, it's not safe to go there. It's too dangerous. And what did the Israelites decide to do? They decided to listen to the 10 and not, not the two. They decided not to listen to Joshua ben Caleb, who said that we should still go. This is God's promise for us. So because of that, because the Israelites made a calculated decision based on, yeah, 10 is probably more right than two. They went again against the promise of God, and they decided not to enter the region. So what did God do? He made them wander in the wilderness for another 37 years before they would finally enter the promised land. This is a map again of their journey. And to think, if they just had enough faith to trust God from the beginning, how much suffering and time would that have saved them? But even in their lack of faith, God remained faithful. God was with them throughout the entire journey, all those 40 years, teaching them one lesson of faith after the next. And I can say, this is kind of, a map of my life too. Every time I take matters into my own hands, 
this is the outcome. It kind of looks like this, just like all this meandering. About five years ago, I had a really serious problem at work. And I didn't realize it at the beginning, but it was something that was totally out of my control. But I try to work things out using my own intellect, using my own reason. And in the process, I developed depression and anxiety. It got so bad that I dreaded going to sleep and I dreaded waking up. I actually developed PTSD to the sound of my alarm clock. Whenever I hear my alarm clock, I would just like my, my body would just tighten up. And I would have to constantly change the sound of my alarm clock so that I can, when I hear a new one, maybe it doesn't bother me as much, but after a while I would get, I would get uh, stressed out by listening to that sound. I would have to switch to another one. And uh, even now when I sometimes hear like other people use the same alarm clock tone, I tense up. Like that's the nature of PTSD, right? And sometimes it takes a while to go away. And uh, that was around the time when we were supposed to go on a mission trip to Kyrgyzstan. I already promised Pastor Lenny that I would go. But at the last minute, I told him that I need to cancel. I need to take care of this problem right now in New York, and I can't go on the trip. And uh, after a lot of prayer, after speaking to Pastor Lenny, I decided to go anyway. Got on the plane, and uh, as we were flying over the North Pole, I just prayed to God that, you know, God, just please take this this problem away from me. Like, I don't want to think about it. I don't want it to rule my life anymore. And while we were flying over the North Pole, all of a sudden, all the worry in my mind just instantly disappeared. He just took it all from my mind. Up to this day, and this was years ago now, I stopped worrying about it. And I knew that however things turned out, whether good or bad, by my standards, everything would be okay in the end. So two years after that that moment that I cast my burdens to God. I, um, oh, sorry, notes were a little incomplete. Two years after I gave this to God, I was, um, Jean's pastors from Taiwan. They were visiting and they were staying at our house. And uh, we took them, it was, uh, it was basically this time last year, we took them to see the autumn foliage and on the way back, I received a phone call from someone at work saying that, um, telling us that the outcome of this problem turned out in a way that could not have been any better. And uh, in my heart, like, I was so relieved. But in a way, I kind of knew, like, regardless of what happened, I was willing to accept that. And I knew that it was going to be okay. And if I had just learned to trust God from the beginning and not take matters into my own hands and just trust him, I could have saved so much trouble and so much suffering from myself, my company, and my family. So now I think it's pretty clear what the X factor is. In fact, X factor is it's faith. It's, it's trusting God. Despite the outcome, you'll end up profiting. You put your faith where it counts. And when you lose, when you succeed, when you, even when you die, you still win. Let's look at this verse. In Matthew 16, 26, he writes, For what will, pro it, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or if you state it differently, basically saying the same thing. For if a man forfeits the whole world, he profits from gaining his soul. So it's pretty clear here, right? That we're called to die to ourselves when we give ourselves to Christ. In hoping against the hope of this world, we show our faith to God. And in doing so, God's righteousness is imputed upon us. We have a sin debt, but he credited to us so that our debt is settled and all is right in God's eyes. So a little while before, we talked about our decision to give our lives to Christ, to receive Christ. And when some of us made that decision, we did so because it seemed like the logical thing to do, right? We made a calculated decision and like, yes, eternal life is better than eternal dam damnation. But if it was simply just a math problem for us, I think we've missed 
a very, very important part of salvation. When Christ calls us to him to be reconciled back to our heavenly father, he called us to let go of our former selves, to no longer hope in the hopeless. So did we really take a step back when we received Christ so that he can step before us? If you haven't done so yet, or not very good at it, I urge you to make a very simple prayer as often as you can. It's something that I just repeat in my mind sometimes. It's just this, Lord, you first. Three words. We let God go before us. It's very simple, but it takes practice. We have to constantly practice that and focus on letting God go before us so that he can handle all the battles for us. Let's pray. Dear Father, I thank you for this lesson of faith. And uh, I just pray, Lord, that as we sojourn through this life, through this world, Lord, that we not constantly learn to take matters into our own hands because we know that when we do that by ourselves, Lord, even though it may seem right at the moment, we know that it is not your will, that you've asked us to walk with you, to trust you in all things and in all decisions. So let us not be overwhelmed by whatever outcomes result from this world. Because no matter what, no matter who's president, no matter what the outcome of any situation that we're worried about, your purposes will always be fulfilled. You are always faithful when we're not. So Lord, I just pray that we give every matter that we struggle with, great or small, into your very capable hands and give us the strength to be the light of the world, the city on a hill, to people who are desperately in need right now, who are lost and don't know where to go, especially in these times, especially in these times when we're facing a possible second wave of coronavirus. Lord, I pray for the safety and health of every member of our congregation, our family members, and this world, Lord. Pray that uh, a treatment will be found soon, and that uh, a vaccine um, will come out soon. But we know that everything will happen in its good time according to your purpose. I thank you, Father, and I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I don't have a, I don't have a closing song today. I think uh, that's it. Does anyone have uh, any questions? How's everyone doing? Trying to go through the list here. There is a picture that I forgot to include in this. Uh, let me see if I can find it. But it basically says, like, you know, usually, like, on your Facebook feed, you'll see, like, these pictures from that people post, like, in the inspirational quotes and things like that. But one was posted by uh, Life Church. It said that um, the thing that you fear the most is the place where you lack faith the most. So I think that's definitely, like, true. Right? The places where, like, we feel are taking over our lives are the place was where we lack faith faith and that's like if you realize that there's a place there's something like that that you're encountering or you're dealing with in your life right now just i just urge you to immediately turn to god and ask him for deliverance from that because god doesn't want you to be totally just like obsessed with these matters of the world right we need to look towards something higher and he's there to deliver us from these things Richard, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, the uh, yeah, I just read the news recently that, and you know, like, I guess none of us can stop looking at these graphs, right? 
of like the number of cases and number of deaths. And uh, yeah, it looks like for certain that there's a second wave coming. So I didn't, I don't think like a lot of people got over the, uh, the anxiety of the first wave yet. And now we're getting hit by a second wave. So we're gonna need God more than, than ever right now. I mean, not just for our like mental health, but for our like finance, for our finances and uh, for our relationship with our families. So I just hope that uh, everyone, you continue to go to God. Lord, you first. Just keep reciting that, and he'll go before us. All yes, right. uh, I think yeah. Pastor Lenny and Jack and myself, you know, we are always available. It is uh, through these challenging times. Uh, if you feel like you need to talk to someone, you feel free uh, to just contact us and, and talk to us. And again, like, um, I agree with uh, what Jack said, you know, um, it's really faith is the deciding factors. It helps us to fix our eyes on God. Um, you know, especially in the in in the midst of this uh, ever changing uh, situations. You know, on one hand things are getting better, and then all of a sudden it takes a terrible turns. And with all the rising cases, you cannot let your spirituality um, be um, uh, determined by all these outside factors. You, we all need to learn to let what is inside of us to guide our steps. There is our faith in God and our God's promise is constant and he's always there and he loves us. So uh, let's hang on together, hold on fast. And uh, like what uh, Pastor Lenny mentioned uh, last week in uh, Hebrews 8, do not neglect um, gather together you know hold on to each other and pray for one another so uh the, thank you uncle check for this wonderful message regarding faith is truly a, a a timely message that we all need to hear and need to be reminded of um and i guess uh, uh you know when thanksgiving is coming soon i mean time really flies by um maybe we can challenge ourselves to just feel um, uh, the, this, the remaining days of this year with thanksgiving, truly count our blessings and, and thank God for his protections, for his provisions and, and for his uh, constant guiding us, even though at times, just like the people of uh, Israel, you know, not knowing where they're going, and, and the faith are constantly being challenged. So it is true that we are facing, you know, different challenges, but it is also not knowing um, how things is gonna turn out. And that really require faith for us to hold fast to his promise. So um, thank you, Jack. Thank, thank you, you all the um, worship teams and may God bless you all. And remember, uh, we have our regular meetings on Friday and also for the daily devotions, you know the time with Pastor Lenny. So uh, we will see you all next Sunday. God bless you all. Take care, everyone. God bless you, you Jack. Thank you. Good to see you. Same here. Anyway, thank you for sharing with Jack. <laughs> My pleasure. I can end the meeting. <laughs> I'm supposed to end. Yeah. yeah, you can end the meeting. Hope everyone has a good week. <laughs> Bye. Thank you for sharing. That was uh, very motivational, for sure. Thanks, Brian.